Uh, well, you guys asked me to finish the game, so here we are. At least we have a sponsor for this one too, and guess what? It's the same sponsor. This video is sponsored by Raid Shadow Legends. And we have a special sponsorship today because they're actually doing something really cool. I always appreciate when games take extra time to flesh out the lore of their in-game universe, and the team over at Raid are releasing an animated miniseries titled Call of the Arbiter, a series which you can watch in-game for free, with new episodes out every Thursday at 10am EST until July 20th. The production value of these animated shorts actually really surprised me. I wasn't expecting them to be of such high quality, but the animation really does shine in the game's unique art style. What really impressed me though was the sound. The music was excellent, but the real star was the voice acting on display. There was genuine emotion in the performances and it showed. But of course, no cinematic masterpiece would be complete without a video game tie-in. When you log into Raid Shadow Legends, you will find a bunch of new Call of the Arbiter related features, new biographies for the champions, and a ton of cool stuff. And if you log into the game for seven days between now and July 24th, you can get one of the new legendary champions from the show, Artak, completely free. And of course, if you're a new player, just scan my QR code or use the link in the description to get a starter pack which comes with this cool in-game loot. So, after you finish the video, head on over to both watch and play Raid Shadow Legends. Now, back to our feature presentation. Hello everybody, and welcome back to my ongoing campaign against Call of Duty Vanguard. Now, our coverage of this video game, uh, such as it is, I hesitate to call it a game, or like a disaster, or travesty mankind but our campaign to fully deal with the historical inaccuracy of this game has been interrupted multiple times by the fact that a particular eastern european man has forgot the lessons of world war ii and started another europe but we are reaching the home stretch we are finally getting down to the last couple missions of the game for me to get for me to deal with so without further ado i present to you the D-Day mission, Operation Tonga. Let's go. If you're meant to lead, you have to learn what it's like to lose men. All right, we made it, what? Three seconds? Maybe four? Four seconds, okay. We made it four seconds before I spotted an error. Now, granted it's me being pedantic, but uh, it's my job to be pedantic. So first off, the good points. I'll move my cursor over. So you can see here that we have a C-47 Skytrain, or in British service, the Dakota. As here. And it's actually very good. I like it. Uh, the cinematics team has done their job well, as we've seen in the other cinematics. The guys handling the preliminary cutscenes and everything do a really good job at checking their facts. Uh, we saw it with the Bougainville mission and some of the others. So, you know, I'm reasonably happy with that. The D-Day invasion stripes are on the aircraft. The camouflage is correct. We've even got the late war RAF roundel with the circle on the side. It looks very good. But our problem is that we're only seeing Dakotas. So the RAF on D-Day was much more varied much more varied than the u.s air force or the united states army air force we're being technical you see the british used a wide variety of aircraft to deliver their paratroopers on d-day mainly because the americans required the bulk of the c-47s so in this formation the c-47s are sticking together which makes however we should also see gliders the raf and the paratroopers used a considerable number of gliders on D-Day. In fact, Operation Tonga, and specifically the Battle of the Merville Gun Battery, which is represented in this mission, had a large glider contingent. Those gliders were tugged by various RAF aircraft, such as the Hanley Page Halifax, Short Sterling, uh, the Armstrong Whitworth uh, Whitley. We should also see an Albemale delivering the Pathfinders, I believe, Albemale. Albemarle. I apologize. Despite being Anglo heritage, I have trouble with some of their more obscure place names. But we should see a larger variety of RAF aircraft in this formation delivering the paratroopers. And we should also see gliders, especially for this mission. But we don't, 
we just see C-47s. So I'm guessing this is a conscious decision to be like, when people think of paratroopers on D-Day, they think of Band of Brothers. So it makes sense that we'll put them all in C-47s because that's what everyone recognizes. We'll just put British markings on them, which is historically accurate, uh, to make it so everyone recognizes exactly what... So I can see why they do it, but it's historically inaccurate. Also, we should see smoke and fire up ahead in front of this formation because this landing was preceded by a strike of Lancaster bombers. So we should see some of them as well around. Also, the weather conditions were pretty dodgy on D-Day, but I don't think they were this bad. Uh, the cloud level wasn't this bad. Anyway, moving on. See, we all, we've already made it like three seconds. <laughs> To have them die trusting you. And it's only one way to learn that lesson. First time I did was on D-Day. All right, lads, listen up. We've got until dawn to achieve our objective. And it seems like the crowds already know we're coming. Now we've got one chance to demolish the coastal artillery. I didn't recognize that guy's patch there. Uh, it didn't look right, though. We've got our uh, airborne jump wings, correct one. I don't know where we saw the patch there. That patch there. Not really sure. I don't recognize. Anyone in the comments who recognizes that one? It just doesn't look right to me. Because the unit we're with, none of the units involved in this particular battle, the battle of the uh, Merville gun battery, uh, were designated number one of anything. It was carried out by the 3rd Parachute Brigade, 9th Parachute Battalion, attached to 6th Airborne Division for this mission. So, none of the patches match up that particular patch. So that's wrong. But I got to give credit. Again, the cinematic's doing a much better job. The actual paratrooper uniforms, the helmets are correct, uh, with camouflage netting applied. They do that, so that's very good. I also like the detail of their webbing and their rigging. They have their main chute and their reserve chute on their chest. This guy's got brass knuckles there. Uh, you also see our pro tag here. Had Mills bombs. So you can see his jump wings. I think they're fixed to his harness. I'm not... You look at our, our hero here. Sorry, I'm back. As you can see, webbing and rigging looks right. The Thick jacket, camo jacket, looks very nice. Uh, British paratroopers did have early forms of camouflage and different types of jackets, so this is really good. I like that. They also have Mills bombs, British grenades. So, looking good so far. I like that. Invasion tomorrow will fail. Now I trade you all for this. Let's not let the Navy show us up. So take the case, mates. Blast the artillery. And fire your flares to let them even know the job's done. Okay, so... Do I really need to point out that you wouldn't pull out your flare pistol and aim it into the fuselage of the aircraft? And also, I like the fact that they've got a British officer's Howard Green jumper. I used to have one when I was a cadet back in the day, and these are really warm. I love them. But you wouldn't be wearing your Howard Green on a drop. No way. He would be dressed like everyone else. The officer's uniform is... Um, so, yeah. Also, his watch is facing up there, it looks like. Anyone who knows anyone who knows anything about military watches, you can see his watch is faced upwards there. Now, normally, that's not a big deal. You see people with that all the time. But for paratroopers and people who were... I mean, I guess the prototype of special operations, they would have started wearing their watches on the wrist to keep the watch face out of direct light. Because your watch face on those old watches before the invention of digital watches, those old watch faces could reflect light. And so if you're trying to be sneaky in the middle of the night and ambushing the Germans, which I would think his watch would be facing I mean, that's a minor detail. He could have very well not done that, but my dad, who was in the army for 10 years, uh, definitely 
definitely used to, he always growing up he always had his watch on the internet. so that's a little done all right this is it you know the drill stand up so those aircraft were flying way too close together way below them they did have tighter formations but not that tight and all i'm saying is if that's happening if this is happening right here well that right there someone needs to be having we've got a full stack formation with no altitude separation for these aircraft and you're above them someone needs to be having a conversation with somebody actually that's a good point something i should mention i've got a video on american paratroopers coming up in the next week or so so keep an eye out for that but one thing i would like to say is the C-47 crews, the transport crews of World War II were often the last selected tier for pilot training. But everyone would go fighters first. So the best pilots ended up in fight. Right Next, you have tactical bombers and pathfinders, like mosquito pilots and low-level attack pilots in like A-20s and all that sort of thing. Then you'd have bombers. Then you'd have ferry pilots. And then finally, at the bottom of the barrel, you would have transport. So... If you didn't make the cut for the combat arms sections, you would be given to the transport. And the thing is, that resulted in your most elite infantry, your best soldiers, being delivered in aircraft flown by your worst pilots. No disrespect to the transport crews. There were some very good transport pilots, and they were all trained. You wouldn't pass pilot training if you weren't able to do the job. It's just that it caused a lot of problems because all these guys aren't trained to be shot at by flak or fighters. They're not trained to fly bomb runs or anything like that. They're trained to show up, drop off what they're supposed to drop off and leave relatively calmly. So when these guys come into combat conditions, flying through clouds and bad weather, they're all like, wait a minute, uh, what's happening? Oh my God, people are shooting at us. They're changing directions. And that's what caused what you'll see in a moment incredible numbers of missed drops the pathfinders got lost because the opening barrage threw off the pathfinder aircraft everything went haywire and the paratroopers were scattered all over but it wasn't it wouldn't be so yeah this is conceivable but I, i'd still be having a chat with somebody after this all right this is it you know the drill stand up okay. look up Nope. Oh. Nope. Anyone who's watched Banner Brothers or played Brothers in Arms knows. And anyone who is jump certified knows. You do an equipment check to make sure the person in front of you is rigged correctly. You also check it yourself. You make sure you do a rig check before you throw yourself out of the airplane. You also check your reserve to make sure that's fixed properly. So these guys are just going to jump out the plane without checking everything's all right. <laughs> nope. Stand by! See you on the ground! Time to leave, buddy. Now he jumps through fire. Yep, there you go. His shoot goes. Alright, so I like that. Uh, I think that his training would have kicked in earlier, but he would have pulled his reserve chute. The moment his main chute burned through and he started falling, he would have almost by instinct pulled his reserve. Would have had to have done. And he's fallen in water. Now this was actually a very common problem for the paratroopers on D-Day because the Germans, realizing that the invasion was coming in the lower areas of ground near the beaches all throughout France and northern Europe, flooded the fields near the beaches to prevent them being used for glider landings or paratrooper land. So a considerable number of paratrooper casualties during D-Day were drownings because they fell into submerged rivers, canals, uh, and uh, flooded fields. 
yeah, a hell of a way to go, or a hell of a way to die. Not particularly gory, but definitely a hell of a way to die. And all that heavy equipment is dragging him down, their rifle, to shoot, everything. But he makes the smart decision, ditches his gear, cuts his risers and his shoot. Up you get. As you can see here, if you look up, there's not a single... There's not a single Sterling, not a single anything. There's no other aircraft besides C-47. Patently wrong. Hang on a minute. Hold on, sorry. i rewind a little bit. I just noticed something. So he gets out here. Alright. He gets out here. Yeah. Holy shit. You see that? Oh my god. Look at that flat crew. That's a Flak 36. That's an 88. Shooting to our left there. It's not a Flak Veerling. It's not an auto cannon. That's a Flak 80. That, that's a that's an 88. Look at the fire rate though. That is a manually loaded. That is a manually loaded single shot breech loading anti aircraft gun, and that's an 88 millimeter shell. That's a big shell. Don't know if you know how big those things are. I've picked one up at like reenactments and stuff. Those things are heavy. Those are big. And just look at the fire rate. Bang. Bang, bang. Bang. Bang, bang. Oh. <laughs> so, I think we know where Arnold Schwarzenegger's dad was serving during World War II. God damn, he's just like, just throwing rounds in. Just shaboom, shaboom, shaboom. <laughs> Dude is hench. That, if you want to know where the Aryan supermen are, they're right here. Good God. <laughs> Thunder. Oh, look at that. He shanked him with a bayonet and it got stuck in him. Oh, bro. What is the What Okay, so I'm going to point out the obvious. Okay. First off, we saw the national emblem on his helmet. So. That should have been taken off. Though, as I said before, the 91st Luftlander is here, so it might be the Luftlander crest, but no, it was definitely on the national color side. Uh, the bayonet lug obviously wasn't strong enough on his rifle because the bayonet came off in our poor, dearly departed comrade there. But I want you to pay a, uh, close attention to this man's uniform. Now he's got an old early war German overcoat in Feldgrau, not the later versions of their uniform, the cheaper make of uniform which most of the guys in Normandy would be equipped with. But I'm going to give you a few seconds to look at this guy's uniform, even from this weird angle. Tell me what's wrong. I'm going to give you a few seconds to work it out. Some of you have paused the video to have a look, but uh, now that you're back, I don't know if you noticed, but this man was armed with a Car 98 rifle. So why does his uniform have magazine pouches for the MP4? He doesn't have an MP4. What are those magazine pouches for? It's going to be a bit awkward getting clips for your rifle out of those. 
I know I'm being pedantic, but it like it's the little details, right? It's the little things. And I wouldn't be so hard on it if it was just a randomly generated soldier, but this is for a cutscene. You would expect continuity in a cutscene. Like it's an interactive quick time event, but you would expect like this little detail part to have some attention to detail on the model, right? But no. <sighs> At least the power is uniform. <laughs> now this is for mission continuation of continuity, of course, rather. But I'm just going to say it here. Paratroop drops were rather drawn out affairs. There were like several wings and waves that go over. But a lot of these shooters make the mistake of just constantly having paratrooper aircraft flying over, dropping more guys, dropping more guys. No, they come over in waves, and once their guys are out the plane, they turn around and get the hell out of here. So, uh, this is complete nonsense. And again, just CC 47s. But what I do like is represented here is the fact that the Germans are advancing in all different directions. Some of them are running left, some are running right. Some of these trucks are driving towards the beach some of them are driving towards the nearby town uh, we've got soldiers with flashlights running all over the place the aa are firing randomly we've got searchlights everywhere the big effect of allied misdrops were they weren't all concentrated in their drop zones especially this particular group so the detachment third parachute brigade six and ninth uh, parachute battalion the guys who were responsible for hitting merville gun battery job we're going on in a moment they were supposed to have a full section of 600 men they were supposed to have a full load of guys ready to take out this objective because of misdrops and various shenanigans that went on uh aircraft getting lost aircraft getting damaged gliders not landing in the correct spot gliders getting shot down etc they only had 150 guys for the actual mission by the end of it the rest of their unit was just scattered all over the place so i like the fact that the germans are running around in panic in all different directions because one of the unplanned un, uh, side effects that was good for the Allies, which I'll talk about in a video this week, was that because their plan had gone wrong, the Germans couldn't work out the pattern of their plan. They didn't know what their objectives were because the Allies just appeared to have scattered themselves all over, and that doesn't make any sense. The Germans are now running around frantically trying to work out what happened. So I actually like that detail. One thing I would say, though, is I would expect more horse-drawn activity, like wagons and such. We do know that the Germans made extensive use of horse-drawn equipment and uh, cavalry patrols in their rear areas, like in police units and so forth, because fuel was come by and so were spares for their trucks. So I would expect to see some more guys on foot or horse-bound German soldiers around somewhere. So there's another reason why paratroopers don't continuously drop. It's mainly because after you initially lose that element of surprise, oh, anyone floating down on a parachute after that initial assault wave is going to be a sitting duck for people shooting. Ah! There it is. There it is. <sighs> Wait for him to switch to it. I know we've talked about it in every mission, but it was a World War I field modification, and it wasn't a detachable mag. And we've got drum a drum mag on an MP again. Something that did not... Yeah, they're perfectly good. See, look, detachable box man. Right.
look! An actually accurate weapon, something we'd expect to find here. And not only that, one used by the paratroopers, quite a lot. Ah, uh, there it is. Come on. There we go. Sorry, I know you guys get annoyed when I do that, but... Uh, there we go. The Sten. Such a heap of crap. But, for five pounds, and able to make, like, you know, a thousand of them a week, out of yield tubes and a spring, like, seriously? Amazing. Also lightweight and very reliable. All around great weapon. The only problem is, because of the magazine sticking out the side, it's very awkward to hold and carry over your shoulder and other stuff like that. And uh, it's open bolt, and because of its, shall we say, furious build quality, it was the least drop safe weapon of all the submachine guns and weapons in World War II, just about. Uh, early users of the Sten reported that if they knocked it the wrong way or if it got banged about, it had a tendency to go off. So, still, it's nice to see it here. Denmark 2. Looking great. And the Webley service revolver as well. Excellent. Thunder! Thunder! Don't shoot! Damn you, Kingsley. We pegged you as a kraut. Lucky we didn't fill you full of lead. Okay, so... Uh, fun fact. The reason why thunder and flash were used is because both words are a bit hard for a German speaker, a native German speaker, to pronounce in English. Which is why a lot of words of the day are selected that They pick words that are hard for the other nation's language to say, so it's easy for them to recognize who's faking it and who's telling the truth. And, you know, also, the day, it's a password. But there's one thing I'm going to be a little bit pedantic about. Kraut was used by Allied troops pretty universally. However, among the Brits and Commonwealth forces, not so much. Especially among the Brits. The Brits would say Jerry. Most like Jerry is more than likely what they would say or a hun if that maybe a kraut doesn't for them it doesn't feel right i don't know it may uh, look it's more of an american terminology than it would be a british one but that's just me being pedantic they very well could say it but i don't know i just feel like Graphics are really cool, though. Nice to see you, gents. Where do we stand? The captain didn't make it, so we're on our own now. I say we dig in and wait for the rest of the sick airborne to assemble. Henry said we had till dawn to destroy the artillery. If we don't, the invasion fails. So you fancy yourself the captain now? Sunup's an hour away. All right. No, I'm going to let this fall. At best, there's no time for a sit-down. Yeah, there's also no muscle or no cavalry coming to save the bloody day. The only thing we can do here is to die or try not hey, to. you two scrapping over who's got the bigger bollocks ain't going to solve nothing. Those German casemates aren't that far away. I think we can get to them in time. So I say we take them out. The company's scattered. We're pissing in the wind at this point. You know what's at stake. You all do. This is madness. Hey, we're beyond madness. Look, I'm with Arthur. We finished the mission. All right, Kingsley. Looks like you're in charge now. Casemates and Valhalla are that way. Okay, this makes me very, very, very annoyed, if not bordering on. So, first of all, Kingsley is a sergeant, corporal, 
and you are the best trained troops in the British Army. And the British Army, among all the armies of the Second World War, the British Army was the most hierarchical. It was the most strictly enforced hierarchical system of the Allied power. The commandos being an outlier, of course, but the Parachute Regiment, all the other major branches of the British Army were very strict orders and discipline, and still are to this day. So the idea that he would be back-chatting his sergeant is just completely out of the question. They also don't have uh, another officer like a lieutenant with them, which they really should have, but if he's the sergeant, he's the ranking person in the area, they would follow his orders. Completely. Number one. Number two. This is a big one. The idea that paratroopers, of all people, would sit there and hide and dig in and wait for reinforcements and yada yada yada. No. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. That is fundamentally against paratrooper training. Paratrooper training is even more so than special forces in many cases. Paratrooper training is designed for maximum aggression. Reason being is you are going to be cut off behind enemy lines, you're going to be surrounded, and you're going to have to make your own way until the friendly forces arrive to pick you up. When everything goes to hell as a paratrooper, as you will find in the video I do next week or in any other book you can read, or movie you watch about paratroopers on D-Day, whether they be British or American or Polish for that matter, or French. Paratroopers, or German, even, Fallschirmjägers were here too, six Fallschirmjäger is based around Carantan. When things go wrong in an airborne operation, paratroopers form what's called the LGOPs, little groups of paratroopers, the single most terrifying military formation on Earth. They will simply organize themselves into little war parties and go and find the enemy and kill them. In the absence of orders, find something and kill it. When the plan goes wrong, we're just going to find the enemy and start killing them until, and we'll work it out as we go. Now, the thing is, they've grouped up. They've worked out what's going on. They know where their objective is. These guys carry out their objective. You see it in Band of Brothers, if you've watched the miniseries. Winters drops several miles away from his objective, and he finds several members of his unit, several members of another unit, all lying around. He rallied his men. Didn't matter it was several miles away. He got everyone together and marched towards the objective. The idea that they would sit here and whinge and go, Oh, you fancy yourself the captain now. Oh, we don't want to do this. We're scared. Oh, no, I don't want to die. No. These men are specifically chosen because if this sort of situation happens, they will say bugger it and go kill the Germans and complete their objective anyway. That's entirely why these men were chosen for this role. They wouldn't have passed paratrooper school without it. Airborne school, jump training, all of it, they wouldn't have passed. They would have been kicked out and sent back to the regular infantry. That's ridiculous. That's, that annoys me. That annoys the hell out of me. The other thing is, of course, that it's historically inaccurate for this particular case, because while they were short of most of their unit, their commanding officer did make it. He survived. Terence Otway survived. And he rallied his men and grabbed the 150 guys he did have and the equipment he was managing to scrounge up and went to complete the objective. So, like it or not, this is completely historically inaccurate, as well as being thematically inaccurate. It's an insult, frankly. You're insulting the men and women of the Parachute Regiment, or maybe I think it might only be men at this point, I'm not sure. But you're insulting the Parachute Regiment. I mean, today, I mean. You're insulting the Parachute Regiment, its history, and its current serving members. Fuck you. Other than that, the one positive thing I will say is we did see he had gammon bombs on. That was nice to see. And he has a rifle and he has rifle pouches. So I've got to give him props for that. I did see a guy with bread magazine pouches around. 
However, they didn't have uh, their stand friends, so I guess uh, we're going to manage with what we got then. We should get moving. What's the plan, Kingsley? Let's get a park cleared. What's you the plan, the Sergeant? Clear that debris. He outranks you. <laughs> There's no way that attitude would fly. Absolutely none. Open fire! Take him down! They're falling back! Move up! Just casually flagged a friend there after bollocksing up the ambush. Up well done. Get escaping! Let's Get down! Go! MG on that half track! Split up! Find another way around! Incoming! Left side! Focus on the depot! I love how he picked up smoke grenades and their allied smoke grenades, their American M48 smoke grenades, not German stick grenades, like N38 grenades right now. And there's that stupid shotgun again. To have a smoke grenade, now that you have one, you're not using it to smoke the machine gun. I guess it's the fault of the player though, not the, not the game, so we can't fault that. Would you believe I almost bought this game myself to play it? Take out the reinforcements! Really riveting gameplay this, I mean. Just like Brothers in Arms, right? Take the bridge. He's giving orders. Actually, I feel offended that I even said that sentence. Forget me. There it is again. I don't know if you noticed it, but just for posterity to recap, a, a, a big ongoing problem we've had in Call of Duty Vanguard. If you look at that MG42 on the half track there, it doesn't have its muzzle booster on the end. And the muzzle booster is vital to actually operate the weapon because it's recall operated so you know as we've mentioned in other reactions to call of duty vanguard this mg42 would not be able to function because it doesn't have the muzzle booster to cycle didn't even need the smoke grenade we could have just walked up on this machine gun but hey apparently it's an attachment in multiplayer so that's fine Holy shit, you just shot your own dude. The tower! Suppress that MG! Okay, so here's a cool little detail. I know I'm being a bit weird here, but if you look at the, these German uniforms, they don't have their overcoats on these guys here. Unlike the earlier ones, you can see that their uniforms are actually that pale greeny color. So these are the late war uniforms. And they do have their accurate gas mask canisters and so forth. And they're messed in. So, there is that. Alright, let's move it. Everyone on that transport. Who remembers how to try? Okay, so that guy just before had a British first airborne patch. There we go. That's good to see. Again, I don't think he'd be here. But with misdrops, maybe. And of course, many of the different regiments were assigned, different groups. And many of them, the original cadre would have come from 1st Airborne, 1st Paris. So, 
Yeah, I'm I'm happy to I'm just happy to see the Pegasus. That's all I'm saying. I'm happy to see it. This is weird. If we go back here. Have a blitz. Okay, so what the hell did we do all that for? Why the hell did we have to assault that machine gun? In case you guys aren't wonder are wondering about that, that is a Mark 7 2-inch mortar. That was a mortar specifically designed for the parachute regiment. We had a mortar. Why were we messing about with those machine guns if we had a mortar with us? Why are we doing all this if we have a mortar? We didn't need to do all that. Uh... <laughs> I, I I know I'm I'm like cinema sins at this point. Like I should have the counter in the corner, but like good lord. That whole plot line just makes no sense because we could have used our inbuilt indirect fire to take out the target. God damn it. Today he's got his entrenching tool. So you know. You can dig a pit for that mortar later. I got this, Sarge! <laughs> Well, that was a fucking kerfuffle. <laughs> hey, Sarge got it done. I just noticed something. Again, I'm being weird here, but... Still has his two Mills bombs strapped to his chest. And his pistol. So when we were crawling through the mud, completely unarmed... Do we just, like, have our shit still? <laughs> Did we just have our shit still? Like... We could have used that Mills bomb and that pistol a couple of times. Would have come in handy. Hey, okay, still got his uh, standard issue uh, British Army belt though. That. Well, that was a fucking kerfuffle. <laughs> hey, Sarge got it done. We're still here, aren't we? I suppose. Eight men standing against the Nazi gun fort. Richard said I'd gone mad. Sometimes, a little madness is called for. I think deep down he understood that, and realized we were cut from the same cloth. Essentially, we've got to find where that command bunker is. Yeah. Until we've got that, we've got no idea. I know. This way, look at those defences. Bloody hell. They're waiting at the table up here. Hold on a minute. Find a bit there. Okay, rifles, rifles, rifles. Looking, everyone looks alright. British camo netting, British canteens. Like, their uniforms are all really good. I like that. The bicycle. Come in handy. Everyone looks really good. This way, look at those defenses. That guy's got a sh old farming shotgun, but looks at it. They're waiting at the table up here. I had to do a double take just before. Because if we go over here. Over on the left here. Well, would you look at that? In a random German box in the middle of Normandy, we have ourselves a Browning automatic rifle. A1 model without the bipod. Long live Jonathan Ferguson. Royal Armouries for pointing that out. 
every time, and I have taken his lessons to heart for a lot of these videos when discussing firearms. Shameless plagiarism, I know, but the man is a fountain of knowledge. But why the Germans would have a BAR, I have no idea. Okay? Whatevs. How's it looking, Sergeant? Best see for yourself. Let's get you the lay of the land. Our targets are the guns housed in those casemates. And we can only get there through a horde of Germans armed to the teeth. That's relatively yeah. accurate. Uh, the time of day isn't... The gliders, basically what happened was the gliders which had their heavy weapons and reinforcements were landing at night still before the main assault. And so when those gliders came into land, they were forced to start the assault early. But they've just completely omitted the gliders and all the other assets needed to take this objective. They're going in with just a company of dudes when they had actually 150 guys. So, or not even a company, they have like a platoon of dudes. <laughs> so, hey. But, you know. The garrison of the gun battery was reinforced after the paratroopers started landing. So... There is an excess number of Germans in the vicinity, so that is actually taking out the lower gun. I fancy my chances. That bunker's our way in, but it's packed with MGs. It'll be a hard push. First job's getting across that minefield. But that anti tank ditch could be useful. And the minefield is accurate. It was idea. surrounded by a minefield which they had to clear with Bangalore we can torpedoes. Punch holes through the mines with those blitzes there. And the bunker will make minced meat out of us as soon as they hear the engines coming. We're going quiet then. No engines. Bail at the last second, let gravity do the work. That should get us to the ditch at least. Well? I love it. Nothing or you could fast. use the mortar to suppress right, the machine then. gun positions with indirect ditch, fire and the men ready. smoke. Tommy. While you using mean? Bangalore torpedoes oh, that yeah. historically Drive you would have, the clear the minefield, the bunker, strap some thermite to some set up a base of fire and Piece cross the objective. Up. And you get a of course, sun burning you know. in the sky. If our ships don't see that flare, if they don't know we've won, they'll fire on the guns and risk taking us with them. That is accurate. Well, I don't know about you, but I think I'll take. But it wasn't a whole fleet; it was just one ship, just one British cruiser. Was friendly. That British cruiser being correctly. Yep, there we go. Royal Navy cruiser HMS Arethusa. That's a perfectly reasonable plan, I guess. Oh uh, yes. One mile an hour, it has enough force to smash through this wooden... That's not how this works. That's not how any of this works. But yeah, you see that guy running past there? That dude has a mortar. What the hell? That guy has... We've got three at least. Assumably, your squad would have ammo. Assumably. Assumedly. What the hell are we doing this nonsense for? We have mortars. Start slinging rounds. I know I'm repeating myself, but please, for the love of God. Get out there! Get Sarge! Again! Get up, man! Time to move! You're rallying your men. I mean... Heavens and weather in position, Sarge! Win on your orders! We're ready for orders, Kingsley! On my command! We charge! Charge! Go, go, go! This whole thing is silly. Now, I would like to say that this part is relatively historically accurate. Germans were dug in and engaged the enemy with machine guns, or in our case, the British with guns. Um, me? To them, it was the enemy. Sorry, I'm rambling. Point is, they did do a charge through the minefield into the German positions, and only a small number of troopers made it to the other end. So this is historically accurate. but. Again, the whole situation that this 
found themselves in was because the heavy weapons and such that I keep talking about, actually the weapons that they have, orders, heavy machine guns, and all the stuff that these guys actually have on them, were on the gliders that got sent back to England or got cut off or crashed in the original assault. In the historically accurate, in the actual event, the heavy weapons weren't present, which is why they ordered this charge. In Vanguard, we have four guys with mortars. We have a whole bunch of smoke grenades. We've got gammon bombs. We've got all kinds of stuff going on. This doesn't make any sense. <laughs> Now he switches to his MG. His SMG, rather. Ready on the door, just waiting on you, boss. You take the lower case, mates. I'll take the upper ones. Don't forget the flare. Let's move up. Do it, Sarge. All right, boys, this is it. You're on me. Tommy! Strike it back. We need to clear the door. All right, lads. Top of you. Gonna have to cut that from here. Use the half tracks for cover. Push! Fire ahead! Okay, so... Well, he stood in front of the half-track and got himself run over, so that's funny. But I'm just gonna point this out here. Okay, so we have two half-tracks here which the guys are gonna use to advance on the uh, enemy positions. Now, fun fact... I don't know if any of you guys knew this, but the reason why these are called jerry cans is because that was the German designed fuel can. So for those of you who don't know, we get the word jerry can because the Brits found out that this can design was really good and copied it, and so did we, or basically the Western world copied the jerry can, but it got its name because it's the jerrys using their can, so it's called the jerry can. So there's a fun bit of trivia for you if you didn't that i see most of you knew it but if you didn't but you get the name jerry can british slang for german fuel can so jerry can uh but the other big thing here is that this is the 716th infantry division and the first battery of the 716th coastal artillery regiment why do they have so many half tracks they're not a Panzer Grenadier unit. They're not a Panzer division. Why have they got so many half tracks? Where are they getting the fuel to use them? Ugh. The trucks make sense, but not the half tracks. Useful for us, I guess. Let's go! May just be one of the first times in this campaign where I haven't had to pause upon sighting an STG-44 because, guess what? They were here and in service. Feels like a miracle saying that, doesn't it? Of course, I'm saying that while he's still using bloody R-98 with a detachable... That chap. It wasn't detachable! Seventy-seven. 77, white phosphorus grenade, which is accurate. They did use white phosphorus grenades to clear these bunkers on this mission. They did. Eyes on that door. Now you use the smoke grenade. Evans, take point. Got it, Sarge. Lights are out. I'll cover ahead while you find a torch, Sarge. Could just let him burn. Yeah. Sarge, torch over here. Best grab it. German torch. Flashlight, <laughs> as the Americans would say. Kind of knew that was going to happen. Now. Why isn't the guy with the torch? Look at that fucking monster! Alright. Here's another historical inaccuracy for the Battle of the 
Merville gun battery. When they actually took the bunkers, they found that the guns inside weren't actually the heavy German artillery pieces they were expecting, but rather old French 150mm guns. Like, they were completely, completely obsolete. They were just useless, right? <laughs> so they had gone through all of this effort, gone through a 20mm AA gun and multiple machine guns, cleared the bunkers with grenades and white phosphorus, and by the time they get up here, the guns were actually old, useless guns instead of effective ones. So... One down, one to go. That's the last of the thermite. Sarge, I could use your help here. <laughs> Shit! Take cover! Smoke ready! Clear them out! Smoke you up! Go! <laughs> Case made is clear. How are we blasting this one? We're out of thermite. I'll feed it a Bangalore. Okay, if you had Bangalores, why didn't you use those to clear the minefield? Also, I should say, uh, this is a bad time to mention it, but uh, this is actually changing history quite considerably because. British paratroopers actually failed to destroy the guns at the Merville Battery. They only managed to destroy one of them. Other guns in the battery were left intact. They didn't have enough explosives to get rid of them. And so these guns would remain a problem. In fact, after the casualties they sustained in assaulting this position, they had lost 50% of their men. They had lost 50% casualties. Which meant they only had 75 men left of 150, historically. And so they were forced to withdraw from the gun battery, and the Germans reoccupied the position. So, this whole mission that we're watching right now is completely ahistorical. Not true. They were unable to destroy the guns because they didn't have enough explosives, because the gliders carrying their heavy weapons and the rest of their supplies, as well as the other 500 dudes they needed for this mission, were all scattered all over the place, or shot down, or forced to remain in England. So, this entire section is completely a historic. Didn't happen. Let's what get up top what did happen explodes. is you, you have the flare sort, because the battery the wasn't destroyed. Go! Get out and fire the, the Royal Navy started shooting at this position. They are about to. At least Sergeant I would assume so. Bombardments any minute. Damn! Flares ruptured! You've got to be fucking joking! Where's Webb? There! Lower case, mate! You don't have another flare? They're coming! Get down! I would have seen you'd have another one. Where's the Webb's flare? Get everyone to cover! We need to run for it! And of course, there it is. Wouldn't be a mission in Vanguard without a Volkstem Gewehr showing up. At least now it's only one year too early. But I gotta give credit, the Royal Navy is shooting a lot better than they usually do today. Funny time to take a kip. I was just waiting for some mad bastard to come and save the day. Well, let's you and I signal our boys, shall we? I was gonna say, while we're having this nice conversation, do you maybe want to fire the flare so the Royal Navy stops shooting at us? We lost. 
And it's a parachute flare. Eh. No. Not from that flare gun. Not from that flare gun, you're not getting a parachute flare. Well, Captain, but we'd won the day. And we'd honoured the memory <laughs> of all those we've lost. Not just There's one cruiser, could, but an entire firing line of cruisers. You look at the soldiers under your command and hope that they can do the difficult those thing. Those destroyers or? The impossible thing. Where are the LSTs? What? Where's the rest of the fleet? Why are they in column and those ships are all wrong? All of those ships are wrong. Completely. I... I don't even know where to begin with this one. Uh... Those are not Arethusa class cruisers, for one. Those ships are too far away, but... Those aren't landing ships. Those aren't amphibs. Those aren't transports. Those are... They look like warships. They got wide beams for warships. These. Those... I don't even know. What are those? I consider myself a, a considerably well-read person in naval recognition, but I don't recognize those ships. What are they? They're not correct. Whatever they are, they shouldn't be here. That flare told me I'd been right. This is what it means to be a leader. Once again, Call of Duty Vanguard. Disappointing me. Well, you guys know the drill. Like, comment, subscribe. Join my Patreon. Thank you to Raid Shadow Legends. I think after this, we've only got, what, two more missions to go? I've been putting off doing the first Aussie mission to Brooke. I've been putting that off. I don't want to. Uh. Oh, well. Thanks for watching, guys. See you on the next one.